All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the Clean Energy Solution Center and welcome to today's webinar which is being hosted by the Solution Center in partnership with the UN Foundation's Energy Access Practitioner Network in collaboration with Safe Access to Fuel and Energy Humanitarian Working Group. Today's webinar is focused on the best practices for decentralized energy solutions focusing on lighting and power in humanitarian settings. And just want to go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you do have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. And if you do choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. That will help eliminate any feedback and echo. And if you're dialing in by phone, please uh, instead just select the telephone option in a box on the side will display the telephone number and the audio pin that you will have to use to dial in. If anyone's having any technical difficulties, you may contact us through the question pane or you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826. And at any point during the webinar, we do encourage attendees to submit questions for the panelists. Uh, you may do that by typing your questions into the question pane and we will save those for the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. If you're having difficulty viewing the materials to the webinar portal, we have posted uh, most of the PDF copies of the presentations and we'll be posting all of them at the cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. And you may uh, download those there. Also, we'll be posting an audio recording of the presentations to that same page within a, a few days of today's broadcast. And just a reminder, we're also adding Solution Center uh, recordings to our YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Now, one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solution Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solution Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And we have a great agenda for you today centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Kathleen Kelly, Paul McCallion, Mason Huffine, and Olivier Jaquette, who have joined us to discuss the role of distributed energy solutions in humanitarian conflict and displacement settings. Before we jump into the presentations, I just want to provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center and the Clean Energy Ministerial. And then Luke Saveri from the United Nations Foundation will provide a quick overview of the Energy Access Practitioners, Practitioners Network. Then following the, the panelist presentations is when we'll have the a question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience. Uh, and then just a reminder at the end of the webinar, you'll be automatically prompted to fill out a very brief survey for us. And we thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond to that. So the um, Solution Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. And the Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the tra transition to a global clean energy economy. There's 24 countries, along with the European Commission, uh, that are members, covering about 90% of clean energy investment and 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And as I said earlier, this webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which focuses on helping government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. And this is accomplished through support in crafting and implementing policies and regulations relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools uh, such as this webinar, for example. And the Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, Sweden, and the United States with in-kind support from the government of Mexico. And the Solution Center provides several clean energy policy goal programs and services, including uh, a team of over 60 global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, the no-cost virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy topics, partnership building with development agencies and regional and global organizations to deliver support, and also an online library containing over uh, 5,500 clean energy policy-related publications, tools, videos, 
and other resources. And primary audience for the Solution Center is made up of energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But then we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and also civil society. And the Solution Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across its suite of different programs. And several of the partners are listed on the slide and include research organizations like IRENA and the IEA, programs like SE for All, and regionally focused entities such as the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, uh, as well as many others. And finally, one of the marquee features that the Solutions Center provides is our no-cost expert policy assistance, known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with one of the more than uh, 60 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. So, for example, in the area of lighting, uh, we're happy to have Gustav Manias Gomez, uh, an enlightened project manager, serving as one of our experts. So if you had a need for policy assistance, uh, in, specifically in lighting, uh, you could apply and we would uh, connect you with Gusto um, or any other clean energy sector. Um, we have experts in those areas as well. And again, the assistance is provided to you completely free of charge. So if you have a question for our experts, please feel free to submit it through our simple online forum at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. And we also invite you to spread uh, the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. And so now I would like to provide some brief introductions for today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is being co-moderated by Luke Severi. Uh, he is a Energy Access Manager for UN Foundation's Energy Access Activities, focusing primarily on the energy access gap in the health center sector. And for our panelists today, first up is Kathleen Callagy, who is a program associate with Humanitarian Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. As a program associate, she coordinates the Alliance's co-leadership of the Safe Access to Fuel and Energy, also known as SAFE, Humanitarian Working Group. And our second speaker, following Kathleen, we will hear from Paul McCallion. Paul is an energy officer with UNHCR based in Geneva within the Division of Program Support and Management and provides technical support to a wide range of projects. And then following Paul, we will be hearing from Mason Huffine, who is Business and Sales Director at Little Sun. He has worked to expand business in Africa and developed a strong humanitarian program within the company. And then our final speaker today is Olivier Jaquette, who is Global Account Manager with Refugees, Emergency in War and Sustainable Development and Global Strategy at Schneider Electric. And so with those introductions, I'd now like to turn things over to Luke. Hi, Sean. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, very excited to be here. Uh, very excited to um, to have this webinar, to be able to talk about it. Very excited, especially about our, our stellar lineup. So I'm going to keep this short so we can all uh, learn more from our, from our expert panelists. Um, today's topic, as was mentioned uh, by Sean, is is we'll talk more about the best practices on decentralized energy solutions focusing on on lighting and powering in the humanitarian sector. Um, I'm first going to provide some introduction in terms of what the Energy Access Practitioner Network uh, represents and who we are. There's, we have a massive challenge on our hands still uh, in the energy space and the energy access space. We're still more than one billion people around the world. Uh, are lacking energy access and then a further billion are lacking reliable access and the numbers on the on the clean cooking side uh, mirror that or, or actually exceed that. Um, so the UN Foundation launched the Energy Access Practitioner Network back in 2011 um, to support uh, or to help meet this, this energy access challenge. The Energy Access Practitioner Network or EAPN in short 
uh, is currently the largest global network of energy access practitioners, uh, currently counting more than 2,500 members. Um, if any of you on the line are, are not yet a member, I, of course, encourage you to, to join the Energy Access Practitioner Network through energyaccess.org. Um, membership is, is free of charge. And uh, through the Energy Access Practitioner Network, we're able to, to share knowledge, we're able to build partnerships and facilitate that, and also to help catalyze actions. Uh, we have a range of of activities. I think the one that is most relevant today is, is our webinar series where we organize monthly webinars usually on a specific theme um, and, and typically also fitting within a series. So this one fits in our best practices series. Clearly the theme today is we're focusing much more on the humanitarian sector uh, than in our, in our previous uh, webinars. So as I said, this will be the theme for this webinar, powering and lighting in the humanitarian sector, uh, whereas in, in recent times uh, the conversation has revolved uh, very actively around, around the clean cooking side, about food security, and, uh, and we are, we're very excited to have this opportunity to, to quite literally shed a little bit more light on, uh, on the electricity side of how energy impacts uh, humanitarian settings. So we'll focus specifically on powering and on lighting today. We also encourage you to, to join the conversation um, on, on Twitter in particular using uh, hashtag PNWebinar. We also always use hashtag energy access. Um, through our, our handle Energy Access PN, PN of course standing for the Practitioner Network. So very briefly, and, and this, this is uh, also an introduction of course uh, to, to our next speaker Kathleen, uh, the UN Foundation's Energy Access Practitioner Network is a, is a steering committee member of SAFE, which stands for Safe Access to Fuel and Energy. Um, but in, in recent years, we've also carried out several events uh, in partnership with, with UNHCR, with Lighting Global, with Gogla, um, to help uh, shed more, more light on, on this topic, um, to talk more about, about solar lighting in particular, but also about powering uh, humanitarian relief efforts. Uh, and lastly, uh, a little shout out to the EAPN annual survey, uh, which we carry out. Uh, or which was carried out over the summer of 2016, which is also available through our website, in which we included a, a small section on, on humanitarian energy, uh, because a, a significant number of our, of our practitioners, uh, of course, two of those are also on the line today in Little Sun and Schneider Electric, um, are, are active in the humanitarian sector as well in addition to their in, in addition to their other activities so without further ado I I'll, I'll pass this back first to Sean uh, and, and then to Kathleen uh, but we're we're very excited to learn more about our about this topic from our speakers Sean yeah thank you very much Luke and and with that actually we'll just turn things right over to Kathleen for her presentation Thanks, Sean, and thanks, Luke, for um, that great introduction. Um, as Luke mentioned, the, much of the um, sort of buzz around this topic in the last couple of years has been on uh, uh, cooking and cooking solutions. So I'm just quickly going to run us through that perspective on things and then uh, set the stage for the discussion of lighting and powering today, which I'm really excited for. So just a brief introduction, um, the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves is a public-private partnership whose mission is to save lives, improve livelihoods, empower women, and protect the environment. And overall, our goal is to create um, or to facilitate 100 million households adopting clean and efficient cook stoves by 2020. Um, a large part of our humanitarian portfolio is dedicated to co-leadership of the Safe Humanitarian Working Group. Um, the mission of which is to facilitate a more coordinated, predictable, timely, and effective response to the fuel and energy needs of crisis-affected populations. The working group is currently co-chaired by us and by um, the Food and Agricultural Association and the World Food Program with a steering committee that includes all of the organizations that you see here, um, especially highlighting UNHCR. Just to give a brief overview on the role of the working group um, and the Alliance's work within it, uh, the Alliance's work is, is based around six humanitarian pillars, um, coordinating the sector, the sector and sharing information on energy access in humanitarian settings, um, 
and this is where the safe working group comes into play largely um, when there are humanitarian emergencies such as the Nepal earthquake we help to um, mobilize around providing pro uh, access to products on the ground uh, related to energy since there is no formal role for this in the humanitarian system um, we commission research and build evidence such as you know uh, the the link between the risk of gender-based violence and firewood collection providing technical support, building capacity through annual workshops that um, aim to train humanitarian practitioners how to think about incorporating energy, advocating for energy access um, globally, both like, to the UN-based uh, humanitarian system, and then mobilizing resources for energy projects in humanitarian settings. So to step, set the stage for our discussion today, as we've seen, we've seen global uh, displacement numbers skyrocket in the last couple of years. Uh, in 2015, UNHCR reported that 65.3 million people are, were forcibly displaced from their homes as a result of persecution, conflict, generalized violence, or human rights violations. That number of, the number of displaced people is in reality much higher when you add in natural disasters. So I think OCHA said it last year at closer to 125 million. Um, the difficulty here is that most of these people rely on biomass energy. Uh, so, you know, firewood, charcoal, um, and uh, agricultural waste as a key source of their fuel um, for cooking, for heating, um, and in some cases even for lighting, so candles, kerosene lamps, and so forth. So the goal of the Safe Working Group is to, um, and, and the alliance within it, is to reduce the risks that crisis-affected people experience because of these um, this poor and limited access to energy. So we've done um, quite a lot of advocacy work around raising the awareness about the these risks that exist. So what you're seeing right now um, are some examples of how energy access plays into existing sectors within humanitarian response, including food security and nutrition, protection, health, livelihoods, and environment. But the reality is that energy interacts with almost every area of humanitarian response. So what you'll see here is the humanitarian cluster system, which is how um, the UN OCHA organizes um, aid um, among its different, apologies there, um, organizes aid into different categories. Energy currently has no formal role within this system. Um, it's kind of addressed ad hoc throughout, but as these little icons show, cooking, powering, lighting, and heating have a role in most of these wedges. So just to, um, before we pass over to Paul, um, as we stated before, uh, the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves has done quite a lot of um, communication around the dangers related to cooking and um, especially related to the safety of women and children. So today we wanted to support this discussion on powering and lighting. Um, and you'll see here just a couple of examples of why these, um, these technologies are so important. Mobile phones, for example, are becoming increasingly important in humanitarian emergencies for um, uh, people to stay in touch with each other and communicate with their loved ones. So, um, you know, in order to make use of many of the, the fancy apps that are coming out of um, the Silicon Valley these days to assist refugees, refugees need to be able to charge their phones. And then, of course, uh, lighting has always been a key part of um, energy access in humanitarian settings for safety, but also for education and the ability to work after dark. I believe that's exactly five minutes, so I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, and we will turn things over now to Paul. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Paul McCarrion, and I'm the uh, Renewable Energy Officer with uh, UNHCR um, and I'm just here to present on basically I suppose lighting and power in a humanitarian context and some updates on I suppose the, the state of play. So lighting and power needs um, across camps and host communities. And Paul, sorry, just um, before you get started, we, uh, we can't see your slides yet. Uh, could you accept the the controls, or we can show them for you. We're good. Okay. How's that? 
Uh, I still can't see them. Um, Hold on. What about that? Yes. Were there? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So um, just to go back. Um, so basically, my name is Paul McCallion. I'm the Renewable Energy Officer um, with uh, UNHCR based out of Geneva with sort of like uh, traveling to the projects for planning or whatever the need may be. Um, so lightning powering across the uh, uh, camps and host communities in a humanitarian context, um, just to emphasize at the start that it's extremely important that any, not alone any planning is appropriate technology wise and culturally wise, but also that uh, both communities benefit from it. So uh, although our mandate may be more with um, refugees, we always have to assure that uh, any work that we're doing ties in with uh, any security or energy policies that the government have and also that the host communities also see the benefit and that we have uh, cohesion and consensus across any of the any of the planning that we do. Um, the slide that you see at the moment was is Azra Camp that's prior to the solar farm that uh, was that, that got up and started last week. Uh, in ASRAC in Jordan, we've just uh, commissioned and switched on 200 megawatts um, of the solar farm for the refugee set. Um, it's exciting for us in that it ties into the national grid and ties into the government's renewable energy strategy. Uh, and it ties into the grid in that the host community are 20 to 30 kilometers away. So the energy going into the grid benefits the country as a whole and then obviously we don't need the environmental headaches of battery storage because it's the grid is our battery. So we put in during the day and we take out at night. Uh, so the state of play, um, fuel and energy poverty across the developing world, um, never mind in a humanitarian setting, is pretty acute. Um, of energy poverty, fuel poverty would be the largest need, um, and with, like what Kathleen had said, it's unfortunately still been mainly based around woody biomass. So uh, some of the stuff you and HR are moving in the direction with partners like the Global Alliance and other partners who we'll go through later, um, is the fuel distributions for the likes of Jordan. Uh, obviously, the vegetation is so little that we're looking at gas um, distributions. Uh, cash for fuel, where we give uh, cash distribution to refugees and sometimes host communities, and they identify the best fuel option. So, for example, in Nepal, it's uh, the cash uh, cash distribution will always be on LPG because that is what the preferred um, fuel is with both communities. Then we're doing some pilots in uh, Niger where we're trying to work with uh, gas distributions through conversion of charcoal providers to become gas providers. And again, that's where scenarios are where there's just clearly not enough vegetation. Um, clearly, we're in a lot of countries, there is some form of uh, you know, byproduct from, should it be gas? and country. Um, on the lighting front, the traditional approach we always took was street lighting and household portable items. That obviously is still uh, very important from a protection point of view or for trying to address basic uh, energy poverty at a household level. Uh, community power would be community centers, uh, maybe beside uh, sports grounds, would be clinics, would be what you'd expect. And then solar farms, there's another one planned for Jordan and the one I just spoke about earlier in ASRAC and then many grids we're starting to uh, try to expand our knowledge uh, and also our energy solutions through many grids. Many grids are like small small solar farms or in some cases they may just be you know 200 watt panels clubbed together um, producing energy for community power needs, community lighting needs. Um, and then, uh, so CBIs, as I briefly mentioned, CBIs, cash-based interventions, 
cash-based interventions is where we try to uh, give cash vouchers to refugees to decide in their own lighting solution, uh, which could be they could decide to prioritize three small lights or they could decide to prioritize one large light with phone charging cap capacity. Um, and then also on the fuel front, it would allow them to associate, to choose the, the stove or the fuel that they find most appropriate. Because as we all know, sometimes the sometimes when you you over design something, whereas you just need to be basic and actually go to the people who you're actually supposed to be working for and say, what do you think the best solution is? So Nepal and Ethiopia, we've been starting to we've been starting to plan for 52 uh, mini grids in Ethiopia, uh, in the Dolowado region, Malkadida for the refugee and host communities. And in Nepal, we've just had, uh, we're in the middle of a very successful collaboration with EWB engineers with their borders USA on uh, mini grids. So uh, we've had a lot of strong technical support from engineers with their borders, and we've had funding from the IKEA Foundation, uh, which has allowed us to uh, do a lot more energy planning and do it correctly and do it in a lot more planned and less ad hoc way. And then some of these, these are just some of the new partnerships. It goes without saying that we've always been involved with a UN Foundation. We've uh, been involved a lot with uh, Light and Global, um, as of Light in Africa, Light in Asia. And uh, we've also been, uh, long before I joined you in HR, we've been working with the Global Life for Clean Cook Stoves. So we're trying to bring the mix between maybe creating creating uh, an environment across camps and host communities that enables uh, ref the target communities to have their markets to have access to products that they choose. So for the likes of Philips or Little Sun or Snyder, um, we're taking, they're just three examples where we're trying to get to the stage where we empower the populations to make their own decision about a product. Um, and also through that, obviously, local vendors would would then start uh, supplying the product and then the uh, product is a lot more accountable warranty-wise and stuff like that. Euroelectric is uh, where we are we working with Euroelectric to try to create a scenario where we've got um, technical expertise from the different European uh, energy or electricity providers. So for example, it could be you know a national electrical distributor from Portugal or Spain or Italy, whatever. So they would offer their high level of expertise across the different the different uh, areas of expertise that we need, be it biogas, be it lighting, be it uh, solar farms. So that's a pretty uh, big and exciting collaboration too. Um, Moving Energy Initiative, we've been working with for the last um, three years, and uh, EWB USA, I've already mentioned, we're starting to collaborate them on the technical side. Uh, Copay, um, we've started to work with them. A lot of these in their early stages, FEO, we've obviously got a lot uh, a lot of common, common need when it comes to addressing fuel. Practical action, we've started working with. We've got a, a strong reputation in delivering market-based energy solutions. Uh, the World Bank, uh, WFP, and GIZ, we're starting to work on with uh, the early stages of maybe trying to move our operations to being less uh, diesel fuel um, dependent. So trying to actually make our operations and our programs also more greener as well as trying to identify the needs of, uh, of the refugees and host communities. And that's me done, and I'm happy to ask questions at the end of, uh, during the discussion period. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we'll move right along to the next presenter, uh, Mason. Okay. All right, press the button. Great, so 
Well, I just want to say thank you for including Little Sun in this uh, program, and thank you to everybody uh, joining who have a passion for energy access to those most vulnerable. Uh, Little Sun is a German-based solar product manufacturer, and we have produced the sort of iconic Little Sun, which actually started as an arts project in Europe, but has become an actual company doing solar all over the world. We produce the Little Sun solar lamp as well as the power bank uh, Little Sun Charge, um, which is a phone charger. And we have other products that we're developing now as well. The, uh, the company is a social business and a registered B Corp. And we're unique in that we have about equal sales in the on-grid market as well as in the off-grid market. And Little Sun has become a bit of a symbol of light and hope in the humanitarian sector. And we can see this when we receive images back from our partners who are doing the work in this area. And because Little Sun has a, such a presence in the on-grid market and on-grid world, we're able to bring attention to this issue through that. Our focus has always been on trade um, and developing our distribution and business networks around Africa. Um, but with a growing refugee crisis, we've increasingly been asked by NGOs and other relief agencies to get involved in providing personal portable solar lamps into these settings. And we've now set up a Little Sun Foundation and have a humanitarian team to support this type of work. And we're starting to see the impacts from this. Um, we've done projects in Ethiopia with IOM. International Migration Organization, supplying lights for IDPs who um, are receiving them in their dignity kits. We've done projects with Oxfam in South Sudan where they put them into their hygiene kits in a women's safety program. We've worked in Nigeria with Save the Children from people uh, escaping the Boko Haram. We've also worked in Uganda with UNHCR in a small schools project providing education lighting. Uh, we've worked in Nepal after the earthquake with disaster relief, and we're doing projects in Tanzania and Rwanda. And currently in Rwanda, we are testing our market-based solution there. And as I think was mentioned before, uh, because energy access has not ticked a real traditional box in the humanitarian sector, such as shelter or uh, water and sanitation, it hasn't actually been that easy to get uh, these kind of products or these kind of things into uh, into these projects and to get these things moving. But we believe there's a really strong case for what I think is classified as portable integrated solar products. We know that there is a demand. Um, we uh, heard from IOM during a recent stakeholder interviews that the stakeholders were requesting solar lamps instead of the traditional torches and uh, disposable batteries that they had been supplied with in the dignity kits. And in this slide you can see a uh, highly technical training document um, which is there to show you that these types of interventions do not take a lot of uh, difficult uh, activities to get involved. They're quite easy to implement. In Oxfam's monitoring and evaluating report from the project we did with them, interviews from the refugees and IDPs in South Sudan said that the solar lamps were the most useful thing they received in their hygiene kit. And in that same program, we heard a story of a woman who had had to flee during a raid, and she um, had found refuge on an island during the, in this very swampy area, and the island was uh, infested with snakes, and often happens in, in during the flood season. And she reported that the solar lamp was really helpful in avoiding getting snake bites. So along with all the many benefits that you have from having small-scale solar lamps, I think we can now add snake repellent to that list. In Rwanda, where we were working on market-based solutions, um, you know, when you really think about it, uh, selling uh, products in very remote locations where the refugee camps usually are to customers with little or no money, um, isn't exactly an obvious business model. But um, Rwanda has been identified as a place to, to test this cash disbursements 
programs, and I think that's the first place in Sub-Saharan Africa to be doing that. And so we decided we would work with the stakeholders there to try to develop a program. So we've been doing trainings with um, uh, re refugees, and we've recruited uh, out of three refugee camps. We have eight entrepreneurs so far. Uh, they've been equipped with a starter pack, including some lamps and a little sun uniform, and they have a credit of around $150 each. And that started at the end of 2016, and they've sold well over a thousand lamps in that time. It should be noted that this is actually before um, cash disbursements for non-food items have been uh, set up, so it's currently for, for food items. And I think that just shows that there, we know that there's a demand and in terms of a priority, we know that there, there's an interest in solar. Um, there are, of course, a lot of real challenges. We can talk more about this later, but um, least of which is that the solar light business, especially with all the sort of fake products or low quality products coming into the African market, the margins are very low and the costs and risk of working in refugee camps are actually quite high. So it's, it's a little bit challenging there. There is a, a lack of capital for uh, entrepreneurs in the refugee setting. We know that um, it's very important to have a local partner who has good relationships within the camps already and that institutional commitment and support is there. Traditional, um, without the traditional uh, distribution systems, it can be very expensive for refugees to be able to get lights. Often they'll have to travel long distances into cities or have someone travel for them to pick up the actual stocks because we wouldn't necessarily have a normal distribution chain there. Um, and there's also this overall issue of balancing traditional aid to those most vulnerable, those who would never be able to afford a light and really need that support with more sustainable solutions and how do you make those decisions. And we've had situations where we've done donations into an area and we're also trying to support entrepreneurs selling lights in those areas. And we've had it where it works and we've had where, where, where it doesn't work and we've had problems. So um, there's issues that have to be balanced out there. Overall though, cash disbursement programs do open up this opportunity and um, but it's our conclusion that there'll still need to be outside support for them. Uh, if there's one thing that I could leave uh, people with as a takeaway is that there is a strong case for personal portable lamps. Um, we, you know, in the in the slide here, you'll see a box. Seventy-two lamps can fit into there, and getting those up into an area that really needs support is much easier than creating large-scale infrastructure projects, which is very often where the conversation goes when I talk to people about working in the humanitarian sector. They want to do big street lights and things like that, and because there's no there's very little maintenance with small-scale solar, and they're uh, very easy to deploy. But ultimately, it really comes down to the fact that there are limited resources for supporting these communities and that really, in my belief, a simple light has the highest impact per dollar spent. So I'll leave you with what I think will become a famous quote someday. Um, with light, people have the opportunities and freedoms that are lost when the sun goes down. Some, some genius said that somewhere. Anyway, thank you very much, and um, we would like to we'd like to work with anybody interested in doing these kind of projects. We'd like to see how we can support you. So, do get in contact. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Mason, and definitely a, a nice quote at the end there uh, by our fellow speaker. And uh, now I'd like to turn things over to Olivier. Hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Sean, for passing me the ball. Uh, very pleased to be included in this panel and uh, have the opportunity to share with you uh, our uh, strategy on offer range for what we call in Schneider access to energy. Uh, it starts with a statement which uh, may sound uh, obvious. We believe access to energy is a basic human right. Uh, this is coming from the top of our company and we've made this uh, a company strategy. So uh, looking into the numbers, uh, which were already presented by uh, Luc before, uh, they are roughly, well, slightly over 1 billion people not having access to electricity, and that's a figure uh, from, from last year. And we really want to take uh, a part with impactful action to try to solve this in the, in the coming years. 
Um, as it was explained by Kathleen, uh, access to electricity is not only for the sake of uh, having plugs at home or uh, uh, simple lighting. It has an impact on many aspects of the lives of the refugees. Uh, health is, uh, is uh, one of them. Uh, security, uh, we recognize that uh, whenever there is light uh, in a camp, security issues are sharply decreasing. Economical development, I think it was shown by Mason before, that uh, it enables uh, people locally to start businesses, to start activities, and uh, get cash and money out of it. Education, because uh, in most of those countries, uh, namely Africa or uh, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, the, the night comes at uh, 6 o'clock. And uh, after that, if you don't have a light at home, it's very difficult for kids to do their homework difficult for adults to have uh, activities. And with the light, it really changes uh, their life. And there are many uh, different applications, as I can see and explain, such as uh, irrigation, uh, water pumping, and so on. Uh, so at Schneider Electric, we have uh, structured our action in uh, three types of different activities. The first one, and I will present it later on, is the different offers which we are trying, uh, as we go, to adapt to the needs on the ground. Uh, it also goes together with business models, because it's one thing to be able to do business in uh, large cities or peri-urban areas. It's another thing to do business in rural areas and uh, refugee camps, for instance. Uh, then you have uh, investment. So we do have a, a fund uh, helping startup companies uh, to uh, develop the activity. We believe uh, we, we can support them and develop this uh, access to energy topic through the startup. And we have a very important piece of our actions, which is vocational training. Uh, we recognize in all those areas uh, that uh, training skills is, is lacking. Uh, we just uh, display a number uh, to illustrate this. Um, I, I, I was told that 80% of the uh, microgrids in Africa are not uh, operating because there is a lack of uh, maintenance skills to make it run. So really clearly we have a, a big role to play. Now uh, going to the, to the offer, uh, basically uh, as it was explained by Paul before, uh, we believe and we identify uh, different steps in the needs that people uh, have in the, in the camps. Uh, the first one is um, a need for mobile devices. So it's basically uh, equipment which we have at individual level, uh, such as the one uh, displayed by Little Sun, so uh, a light which was rechargeable with a small solar panel. And it could include a USB uh, charging device for mobile phone as well. Then we have a second step or second level which is uh, to provide access to electricity at a house, at a home level. So it, uh, it, um, it, it comprises a system made of one battery, uh, three, two to three outputs for uh, lighting uh, two to three rooms in the house, and then uh, also some outputs to feed a radio, fan, or a DC TV, uh, which can enable people to have access to information as well. And the third step, uh, which is the ultimate one, is to start develop a community solution, such as microgrid. So you would have a small solar farm, and then you would be able to distribute the energy to uh, different households. Uh, so that's basically the three steps, which corresponds well to what uh, UNHCR CR described before. And it uh, concretely uh, translates into this offer that we have at Schneider. Again, there are many others in the, in the market, but this is what we promote. So for mobile solution, individual solution, we have this lamp uh, together with a USB charger for mobile phone. For home, home uh, appliances, so we can put this, for example, in uh, shelters, uh, enable to light two to three rooms. And then a simple uh, system to feed, uh, uh, let's say, a district of a camp or a group of houses. And it all, again, it all comes with training. As we speak, 20,000 units of the what is called here Mobia is being distributed to a camp in Chad. 
and we see that even for simple devices like this, training is needed. We have to explain to people uh, how to use this. By the way, together with the packing, we have a notice for use, which is uh, uh, using only diagrams, drawings, not any explanations in written, because some people cannot uh, even read and write in the camps. So basically, we have, uh, as part of our strategy, we have set ourselves uh, some ambitious objectives, starting from where we are today. Since we started this initiative of access to energy uh, 10 years ago, we've uh, helped 4.2 million people uh, have access to energy. So not only in the camps, but also in uh, rural areas for the most uh, people uh, in need. Uh, and we want, uh, by 2025, to increase this number up to 50 million. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and starting from 100,000 electricians trained uh, in the world, we want to go to uh, uh, 1 million. So another uh, axis for uh, action, which is going to be uh, a, a great challenge. Uh, and for this, we're looking for partners. Uh, Obviously, Schneider Electric is involved uh, mainly in uh, studying electrical and automation products. And uh, in order to provide full solutions, we, we do want to partner with uh, companies, startups, uh, willing to develop this uh, access to energy initiative. So thank you very much. I hope this will uh, attract your interest. And I remain at your disposal for any question you may have. Excellent. Thank you, Olivier. <clears throat> Um, at this point, we will have the um, uh, moderated discussion uh, amongst the panelists, which will be moderated by uh, Luke. And then following that is when we will have the, the question and answer session with the audience where we can address any questions submitted by the attendees. Uh, so I'll turn things over to Luke now. Thank you, Sean, and, and, and thank you, Kathleen, Paul, Mason, and, and Olivier for, for, those, uh, for those presentations and for, for perfectly setting the scene. Uh, I have a, a range of questions. I'm sure we won't be able to cover them all today. Uh, and, and I want to start with this, with this nugget, which, which comes from a recent report that states that out of 8.7 million refugees and displaced people in camps, only 11% have access to a reliable energy source for lighting, 11%. Um, so that's that's the backdrop against which we're working and against which we're, we're all trying to to see improvement. Um, it's been mentioned twice uh, in in the presentations today, and and I want to start with that, which is the call it international recognition, call it a, maybe an, an increased need for coordination because because it occur, is currently not a specific cluster. Um, there's there's no specific um, coordination or, or a lead agency, one agency that, that's taking the full lead when it comes to, to energy, uh, which of course comprises multiple subsectors when it comes to either electricity or heating uh, or, or on the cooking side and so forth. Similarly, SDGs, there's no specific SDG on refugees, clearly they, it, it touches so many of them, um, but again, it, it, it shows that with more actors getting involved in this, especially on this nexus issue of humanitarian relief uh, meets energy access, more players are entering the field. Uh, we saw many being mentioned already today, but maybe a question first to, to Kathleen, because you mentioned it first on the on the cluster approach and and uh, and and where what what would you like to see? Where what is happening? What are possible ways for increased coordination and, and where where is this moving? Uh, same question to Paul, but maybe Kathleen you can kick this off. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, um, we have always wanted to see more formalized collaboration around the UN humanitarian system. However, it is not um, necessarily required um, for energy to become a, a major topic in humanitarian response. Um, what is really needed, I think, is for um, major humanitarian agencies to start thinking about how to holistically incorporate access to energy in their existing programs, whether they're surrounding health um, or shelter or, um, or education. And uh, that really comes down to advocating for this topic and um, raising awareness and educating um, each of these organizations about how 
uh, how important energy is and where that fits in. And I think the Alliance and UNHCR and all the members of the Safe Working Group have really taken up the banner of um, advancing that discussion in the humanitarian space. But um, I'd, I'd definitely like to hear Paul's perspective since Paul is coming from the field level. Paul, just to add to that, and, and maybe more from a UN perspective, then we've we've already heard about IOM. Uh, clearly, WFP and FAO are also uh, playing an important role in in their specific uh, fields of expertise. Uh, what's what's the level of coordination, and, and where are you seeing things going uh, on that aspect? Um, well, um, I think Kathleen there is uh, give a very good. <laughs> Uh, overview. Um, on the UN side, I suppose uh, within a UNHCR scenario setting, like, uh, and again going back to Kathleen's presentation, whether it's shelter, you know, or wash or protection, energy is a big part of ticking a lot of those boxes. And uh, with regards to the, the cluster side of it, uh, it is surprising that there hasn't been there hasn't been a, it hasn't been coordinated from the start. But I think that's more to do with whether you look at uh, NGOs or you know development or humanitarian the different side. It's always been neglected. Um, there are a lot of very specialised NGOs, and uh, it's there's never been a there's never been I suppose like a global champion or advocate um, on it. So on the UN side, I know now. Um, well, then, just what, what we've been doing in the energy section in UNHCR, we're doing a lot more now with uh, FAO, uh, WFP. Um, at the moment, we are just trying to get, uh, to try and to take it one step at a time and that solidifying where we're working on common ground with the FAO, solidifying where we're working on common ground with uh, WFP. We also always have weekly discussions within the organization. I've just left a meeting where I was with protection, obviously. And at the moment, it is it is baby steps, um, and it's more like trying to individually pull it all together uh, and, and agreeing internally where, the, like, we don't want replication. There's been an awful lot of replication. So it's getting, it's getting that ironed out and then uh, setting up a culture of sharing of knowledge and sharing of um, strengths and weaknesses. Thanks so much, Paul and Kathleen. Uh, linked to that, because we have so many new actors in this space, uh, which, which we can only encourage and, and, and be, be very excited about, there's, a, there's always a big dichotomy between the short term and the long term, or humanitarian versus development. Clearly, there's not a, a clear break in terms of where the, the former ends and, and, the, and the latter starts. Um, but it's I'm curious to see how how you have been experiencing, and, and it's, it's a question for everyone, um, especially those actively working on the field, how are you experiencing this change in terms of uh, a, a switch towards more long-term planning, which then again allows for, say, investments in renewable energy solutions much more than a, than a six-month or a one-year Funding cycle uh, in which you're you're pretty much limited to the to the to the snappy approaches, uh, be it a diesel genset or uh, or, or or lanterns, uh, kerosene lanterns. Um, maybe maybe Mason, you can start this off. Uh, how how have you as a as a supplier uh, been experiencing this, uh, and and how have you been been able to engage? Say further and further, uh, and, and, and partially influence maybe as well uh, how this sector is, is approaching this issue. Well, first I would I would say I would sort of put a reminder out there that most of these interventions were not economically viable, you know, ten years ago. So you know, when I started, the price per watt was seven dollars a watt. Now it's less than thirty cents per watt. So the the game has changed dramatically in the last few years, and it's not surprising that large institutions aren't that nimble and quick to, to change with those kind of realities. But well, I was advised when I first started looking into this by some of the hardened humanitarian workers that are out there that it's a very long process and that I should start by communicating with people in the field, uh, the, the field offices, 
and setting up projects with them so that they could get experience with using these technologies on the ground and send that signal back up to the people who write the funding programs because without you know there's a demand and supply in the funding of these processes so getting it onto the into the into the ground, getting those folks to go to their head offices and saying, hey, these, this really works, we're getting a lot of positive impact here, can you write that into the next tender? That's kind of the approach they told me, and they said that that would be a three-year long process, and frankly, it's been that long. And I'm now seeing a change. I'm seeing people come to us and saying, hey, we want to start to include this, how do we do it? So I think I'm seeing a, a slow change, but it's been a, a long-term investment. <laughs> Thanks, Mason. Olivier, do you wanna do you wanna add maybe the, the Schneider perspective on this one? Yes, with pleasure. So this was actually one of my first uh, three questions when I first met with UNHCR. It was uh, with Paul Quigley and another Paul. <laughs> uh, is how how long on average would a camp uh, exist? I mean, what's the life expectancy of a refugee camp? And the answer of, uh, provided by Paul, and I speak under your control, uh, Paul McCallion, is over 20 years on average. Uh, that's uh, really uh, not, not a good number to have, but that's reality. Uh, I believe with a 20 years life expectancy, yes, maybe uh, uh, people are thinking of investing over a long time. Uh, to make sure that the people who are born in the camps and live most of their life in the camp uh, can access uh, uh, rather a better infrastructure. And I think there is room for investment. So far, uh, we have not seen it very well. But back to the number I mentioned before, 80% uh, of the microgrids in Africa are not operating. I think there are still technical obstacles we have to, uh, we have to overcome. Uh, in terms of uh, monitoring platforms, in terms of uh, uh, remote control of those uh, systems. Um, but I think we have everything in hand to solve it. So, so there, is, there are opportunities in front of us, I think, uh, to help equip those people with a much reliable uh, installation. Great. And, and let me pick up on that because it was actually my next question as well is so in in, in recent reports uh, the, the number 17 years is stated as the average stay of, of an individual in a camp more recently I've, I've been hearing uh, even 26 uh, being quoted on, on numerous occasions I mean clearly if, if I'm not sure we need more information to to make that switch from more short-term to long-term thinking and, and planning um, Maybe, maybe Paul, if you could uh, dig into a little bit deeper into this, what do we need on the on the data side or on the evidence side to to get uh, whoever is is able to facilitate this more, i.e., the donors, um, to um, to to come around to this to this mindset as well. The more long term thinking, and especially on the planning side, and and thinking multiple steps and multiple years ahead. Um, I, that's a big question. Uh, I think, uh, for example, the, the Moving Energy Initiative, which is a different funded uh, initiative, where you've got a, a strong commitment, you know, to trying to bridge bridge a gap between you know access to energy and greater involvement by the private sector. It's it's always been an area that that. NGO, well, humanitarian development and the private sector have never been able to feel comfortable about entering or, or how to enter it. And I think that the, at the, there's two, two big, uh, two big uh, topics in that, that, that need to be involved in that one, like uh, national governments and their strategy to energy and maybe the right to work for refugees. Uh, then on top of that, donors advocating that the, the collection of data is so important, but uh, the collection of data hasn't happened because it's never been as such. Like uh, donors wouldn't say, "Well, here's you know X amount of funding over X amount of years, and we want you know twenty percent of this must be spent on energy-related activities." So the reporting back on you know energy interventions uh, has has never been there. So we think um, it's a cross between working with governments 
to maybe in, uh, allowing more interaction between refugees, host communities, and right to work, and also uh, strong advocacy by um, by donors to, on the humanitarian development sector would allow us to collect the data. So the I think it can be addressed definitely, but it needs to be playing catch up, and uh, it needs to be driven a lot more from the the host governments with donors to try to provide the data, to try to move energy access forward, which then in turn, you know, will allow will allow refugees and, and host communities to actually find alternative ways to to create income generation. People don't want to have to, you know, spend two days a week collecting firewood if there's an alternative for them to Recharge batteries, charge phones. You know, uh, use refrigeration to supply products. Uh, it's just human nature. If you can make an income in a less labor-intensive way, you'll do it. So it's more at the high level that there has to be a maybe a, a change in the approach to how funding through energy and climate change is done. And let me let me follow up on that and on on the private sector side. Mason, are you happy with the progress that's being made in terms of involving the private sector in in um, in the interventions and and whether it be uh, opening up a market uh, rather than a procurement procedure? Um, because you mentioned the the, the low quality um, competition that that you're you're sometimes in and that you're something sometimes trying to beat and, and and that's that's obviously a big issue in in any normal market uh but but equally so in the uh, humanitarian settings can you talk a little bit about about that about how how can we get the private sector more involved what what would you like to see well you know specifically for working in refugee camps um you know these are they're all different everywhere, so there's no there's no one that's the same. But it, it does seem to me that the, they're often very kind of restricted. Um, not everybody can go into those, so you have to get permissions. So for us, having a local partner who already had been in the cook stove side of things and already had the passes to go in and was allowed to do the trainings, um, that really helped us because we wouldn't have been able to, to do that ourselves. Um, I have to say, though, it, it's still quite difficult to, to get those liaisons working, probably because it's just a very difficult environment to begin with. But if there was you know, a focus, like a program to kind of encourage this type of activity, like there is in Rwanda right now, um, then that might make it easier to kind of even be allowed in and, and create those things. Um, I do know that a lot of governments aren't exactly happy about having refugees, and the idea of creating you know, infrastructure projects or, um, you know, bigger home systems in people's houses, it may be that that becomes a nicer place to live in, than where you came from because you didn't have light there. So um, that's one of the reasons why we've been advocating personal portable lights because people may want to move back. You know, governments, we, ha we have an early, as a small business, we don't really get too much involved in the government side of those things, but on the on the larger side of trying to to get um, the business things going in there. One of the reasons why we do think this could be an opportunity is that uh, countries like Ethiopia are trying to implement rules to kind of make sure uh, only lighting global products like Schneider and Little Sun and D-Light and Sun King and all these others can be um, allowed in, but the others have to go through quality assurance tests. Um, and in an environment like a refugee camp, those kind of rules could be implemented because the last people in the world that need to be cheated are the refugees, the ones that have the least amount of resources. Thanks, Mason. That's that's very clear, and, and I think you're echoing concerns that that everybody around the table and, and many in our audience will 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 have. Um, Olivier, a similar question in terms of how do you uh, how do you make sure that that you capture the needs of of those that you that you want to help or those that you want to to supply an, an energy product or even thinking somewhat larger an energy service to are there any are there enough studies is there enough data regarding willingness to pay versus then of course the ability to pay 
well, it's, it's, it's quite difficult for me to say. Uh, I think the, the work we are doing around, you know, uh, optimizing our offer range for, for this specific market, as we call it, uh, we, we, we collect data directly from NGOs, which are uh, partners. We collect data from uh, institutions, such as UNHCR. Uh, we also uh, get feedback from the 140 countries where we have a commercial presence uh, in order to, to try to converge to a solution that we believe we can, uh, we can uh, sell. However, what we see uh, on the ground is that it is uh, much more difficult to address the business uh, in a diffuse manner locally than to, to try to distribute uh, large volumes through uh, major institutions or NGOs because they have much more means than uh, what we find uh, locally. And obviously that is a uh, uh, However, I strongly believe in the approach uh, that Mason uh, presented. I think uh, in those camps with a lot of uh, people with uh, energy, willingness to succeed, uh, to to find ways of developing uh, activity and uh, this type of, um, let's say, access to energy can provide opportunities for them to develop their business. Uh, charging phones, uh, charging solar lamps, mobile lamps. Uh, I, yes, I believe there is opportunity. Then the concern we have is to try to make those business models viable. I mean, you have to come up with an initial investment. Uh, for the uh, local entrepreneur to run his business properly and also think uh, of uh, how do you recycle uh, batteries, uh, how do you manage the environmental impact, etc. So it has to be a, a full plan over the life cycle of the product. Exactly. That, that was my follow-up question, so I don't need to ask it, but exactly, as, as Mason said, on the quality standards, be it Lighting Global or, or other international standards or national standards that, that are being enforced, with, with quality comes responsibility on, on your end, of course, uh, to make sure that, that warranty periods can be, can be honored and that, uh, especially you, Olivia, you mentioned this very clearly in your presentation as well, the, the need for training and the need for, for skills to be, to be present, skills to be transferred. Um, it's it's a, it's a very big aspect. Maybe Paul, can you pick up on the on the training side briefly? Because it's I, I don't want this to be underrepresented in this conversation. Um, are, how how do you what what's UNHCR's position in terms of uh, maybe stepping away from the pure uh, distribution and, and the procurement process, but including this this skills transfer in a, in an attempt to create more more long-term sustainability or at least have have some sort of a an end-of-life strategy or a, or a life cycle uh, strategy in place for these types of products and services yeah um, well there's one example I'll give which is on the knowledge transfer and the skills transfer and uh, I see it now in, um, in uh, the Doloado region um, um, Ethiopia on the Somali border and the, and the camps and host communities. Um, those who are providing energy uh, through a generator to marketplaces on the host communities, to houses and host communities, they have a very sophisticated but simple way of doing that. They will buy a, a cheap but well-trusted diesel engine. They will then buy a very cheap but well-trusted alternator. They will connect the diesel engine to the alternator by finding a tire from a car, a tire from a lorry, cutting it in half, and they, instead of using what we would call a flexible coupling, which is, you know, like a, a shaft that's movable to connect the two, and they just bolt the diesel engine to the alternator. And the alternator turns, and they provide electricity. The knowledge transfer on basic mechanics and electrical is there. It's been there for let's just say 80 years. So the local solution works, and they've 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 a very good knowledge transfer on how to repair a generator, on how to repair a diesel engine. Um, sometimes they'll just take the filter out. They'll just basically have a large jerry can with a pipe, 
which hangs from a coat hook and goes straight in supplying oil rather than go through you know the oil system that has uh, stopped working and a generator after two years of constant use. So knowledge transfer is is key to the sustainability side. So on the solar front, obviously if you go to different regions of the world, there's different amount of knowledge. Um, our camps and host communities in Nepal have a very very basic but very very workable uh, understanding of household solar and how they use it. Uh, they may not use things like a, a solar charger or a charge controller or regulator. Uh, they will take the energy straight in, but at the same time they will they will maintain panels and stuff like that. So on the training front, we're just about to uh, go into our first ever energy services center, um, which we will be training. Uh, training refugees and host communities across maintaining of streetlights, installing of streetlights, uh, installing of uh, mini grids, maintaining of mini grids, as well as the basic education on the proper charging of lanterns and the proper use of batteries. The only way that we are going to address this is by getting the knowledge to communities in a very pictorial, practical, repetition way. So we need more more uh, energy technologies that are very easy to transfer skills, but equally people, people see where they make their savings so that they understand, okay, I can, pay, I can pay 20 cents for a couple of AA batteries and they will last me a week, or I can actually use rechargeable batteries. I can have a stall that charges them using a small you know, solar panel going directly through a charger and I can recharge batteries for people continually. So uh, the price, the fact that solar, the price of solar has dropped is welcoming, but the commitment to training, I think we went away from it, I think it was there maybe in development within the 70s and 80s, and then for some reason it was at, at, uh, vocational skills we thought is less productive to create in livelihoods, and we sort of dropped it. So I think across the development humanitarian sector and particularly private sector companies who come in with this knowledge that uh, it needs to be given a lot more focus. So we're starting to look at it through pilots that we ran on the Lido of Light where we worked with refugees and host communities to help them to assemble lights. Um, so I, I think that the supply chain and the way that we transfer the knowledge is, is uh, needs, needs to be given careful attention and there needs to be a lot more commitment by all organizations with an interest to uh, to to you know re reinvigorate training uh, through you know community structures and national governments because we're going nowhere we will still end up with 80 percent of of small solar grids or small diesel generator grids not working which is uh, which is probably I would say the reality if we don't completely reapproach how we do knowledge transfer and skills transfer. Thanks, Paul. Um, I I would like to end this this moderated conversation with with one more question um, for for Kathleen because I want to end it on a on a very positive note. Um, I, I think I the originally I, I wanted to get a little bit more information on the on UNHCR side on the ASRAC plan, but it was mentioned mentioned already in the presentation. I encourage everybody listening in to to read up a bit more in terms of what's happening and how that has materialized because it's it's a it's a good example of long term planning of bringing in uh, the energy needs of of refugees as well as host communities and, and really planning for the future. Um, so, so I encourage everyone to read up on that. Uh, Kathleen, the last thing I want to ask before I hand it back to Sean is, can you just, in, in two sentences, no, maybe in, in more than two sentences, in two minutes, um, just talk a little bit about the work that SAVE uh, has been doing and especially uh, focusing maybe briefly on, on the Nepal uh, crisis, the Nepal response and, and how, how the, the, the need and the, the benefit of, of that increased coordination that we that we saw probably for the first time on this specific nexus issue in Nepal. Uh, thanks, Luke. So, um, despite the fact that energy is not uh, formally included in um, the UN infrastructure around humanitarian response, it's uh, not. Um, 
it's not invulnerable to the same problems that happen in every other uh, UN cluster, which is essentially that, as Paul mentioned earlier, there is a lot of duplication and a lot of reinventing the wheel. So the benefit of having um, a group like, a cross-cutting group like the Safe Working Group um, is in order for, to sh share knowledge and exchange information such that uh, these problems that, so, such that we've discussed already in terms of willingness to pay, ability of refugees to pay, or um, appropriateness of technologies, providing training to users, is something that we can all collaborate on and share best practices. Um, so that's a, a key role of, of the Safe Working Group. In terms of Nepal, um, the, when the, when the the earthquake happened, you know, as, as happens in, in many natural disasters, cooking facilities were lost, the ability to charge mobile phones. Um, and what we were able to do as the Safe Working Group is we ha you know, basically have weekly calls with all of the major aid agencies who were coordinating providing energy products um, into the country. So um, Mercy Corps was providing D-Lights, which are um, solar lanterns. Um, this excellent organization called GOM Power was going across and um, providing uh, solar panel-based uh, mobile charging stations across, um, across Nepal. And another key aspect of this in terms of just making sure that energy needs were even assessed at all in the rapid assessments that um, were initially done on the ground, um, that the products that were being provided were of good quality, whether that was you know, based on Lighting Global um, or uh, other standards existing, um, or the you know, um, IWA standards for cook stoves. And also, um, making sure that in the provision of these products, we didn't disrupt local markets. Um, Mason mentioned earlier that no government you know, is, is necessarily very happy about having refugees in their country, but it's doubly complicating when uh, relief products are flooding into an area that um, already has a certain, uh, this type of product available. So working with local markets is actually very much in everyone's interest. Um, does that answer your question? Perfectly. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Olivier, Mason, Paul, and Kathleen for, for this very, very engaging conversation. Uh, I, I've been taking notes throughout. I think my, my key takeaways are, are that there's, there's definitely an increased need for, for more data, for more evidence, and, and signs of impact to help influence this short-term versus long-term debate and to, to work more towards, towards the long-term uh, planning. There's there's been very positive developments on the technological innovation side, um, which which actually have made it possible for us to to have these conversations, to talk, uh, to 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 have Schneider, to have Little Son, to have many many other energy practitioners to participate in this conversation and to actively help uh, help satisfy the energy needs of refugees. Um, However, that has meant that there's probably an, an increased need for training, for skills transfer, where again, uh, the private sector can play a very important role. And thirdly, and I'm keeping this for last because it's my main takeaway, it's the coordination, it's the need for, for partnerships, and, and to make sure that, that everybody who needs to sit at the table has a voice, and, and that includes specifically host communities because they may actually be impacted in a negative way um, even when we do energy interventions. So so those are my main takeaways. Once more, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I'm, I know we've had a range of, of questions being being sent in through the audience. Um, we won't be able to address them all, but, but Sean will pick out a few and, uh, and, and, and we'll address those as best as we can. Thank you very much. Sean? Great. Thank you, Luke. And uh, yes, excellent discussion. Um, we touched on a lot of topics, actually, that we have received questions from the audience on. So um, yeah, the great information there. Um, we do have a couple questions I'd like to get to before we wrap up. So this is just open to all the panelists, um, especially this first question. I think it applies to everyone. Um, for um, one of our attendees that has done work um, in humanitarian settings, specifically in uh, zones that have any kind of conflict, um, they note that it's a complex scenario with climate change and political processes creating conditions that do not lend themselves to progress. 
Um, and uh, that populations, as they become more concerned just about basic security, um, what are some, some ways to work in those situations and under those circumstances um, that you have experienced or that you would recommend? Um, this is Paul here. Is that the security of the people uh, of the uh, people working uh, with with the target group? So is that the security of the actual people living in the area? Uh, the way the question is worded, I would uh, interpret it to mean both. Um, but okay. more, uh, so, more so the people in the targeted area than the providers. Yeah, uh, the the way it's been traditionally approached is. Um, you know the the importance of of uh, integrating, trying to integrate as as carefully as possible between the two communities, um, and also uh, the need for obviously the need for lighting. Um, so I suppose uh, different culturally, sometimes it's it's very very different, as as uh, was said earlier. Like no camp is the same. So it's a combination between trying to coordinate closely. That there's there's harmony and less tensions between both communities, so that eliminates any unexpected developments, and then um, obviously trying to provide as uh, as much energy infrastructure as you can to prevent you know um, to prevent uh, uh, issues happening at night, and also a big one is the collection of firewood. So by trying to address the fuel issue you are uh, taking away something that's normally always a big bone of contention, be it with host governments, host communities, and refugees. Great, thank you. And so to Just summarize, um, you could connect the, the energy um, issues in those services to solving the security issues um, would be one approach. Big time. Great. Um, another question from one of our attendees um, that has uh, been working on a, a DC microgrid project in an off-grid village in Pakistan. They note that they um, are facing issues in engaging with the local government and uh, especially to ensure the longevity and sustainability of the project. And the local district committee is, is basically uninterested at this point. Any recommendations or best practices on approaching this issue? Um, this is Paul again. Sometimes that can be very, very difficult. Um, it may help in some instances to to speak, uh, you know, at, at the government level and try to uh, renegotiate the uh, or negotiate, you know, the percentage of of impact. So, uh, okay, if we're going to do this project, you know, fifty percent of it will directly impact. A host community, and then the other 50% will directly impact the refugee community. At, on a country by country basis, it varies, but sometimes trying to to even out the impact or the the funding of the project across the communities. Like sometimes, irrigation projects will be 50/50 because it's producing food, and that's so essential. So uh, sometimes things like that can help. That would be the only sort of like case by case example I would have. If anyone else has any suggestions. Um, this is Kathleen. I mean, I would just add that um, as as with any any partner that is troublesome to negotiate with, um, to find out where possible what the priorities of of this government are. Um, Safe has been fortunate to work with um, governments um, such as the government of Rwanda and government of Ethiopia, who are actually quite um, amenable to uh, solutions for refugees because they understand that it directly impacts. Um, the environmental health of their country, um, given the impact of deforestation. Um, so it's really just presenting um, a way of addressing this issue that is absolutely within the government's interest, whether that's um, you know promoting environmental health in the long term or saving money in the long term, um, making your argument on those grounds. Great, thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, maybe maybe another another practical example we got in Vietnam while equipping an ethnic village with a hybrid uh, off-grid system. 
is that we negotiated with the local authorities uh, everything before the investment took place because we have to realize that once the investment is made your bargaining power is less so uh, it's important that all the conditions that will be necessary to fulfill at the time of operations are agreed and uh, put in writing before the investment is made great thank you Olivia um, so we probably have time for about one more question. Um, we've received a number regarding funding these projects, so I'm going to try to group them together um, into one more concise question. Um, could you just explain, maybe uh, everyone could just take a few seconds to explain how their projects are, are typically funded. Um, and then has anyone, um, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about um, donors as a funding mechanism. Has there been more uh, work recently into other business structures such as pay as you go? So just to recap, if everyone could uh, just briefly say their, their general funding structure and then has there been any advances on pay as you go structures? Kathleen, mm. I can, oh, okay, so go ahead Mason. So, okay, I'll just quickly uh, start with that. Um, well, we've typically in, in the humanitarian sector have, have, have had either individual donors who want to do a program or a project with that, or we've had NGOs um, procuring those. Uh, for the investment in the market-based solutions, we've done that as a company, um, but we know that it's not necessarily going to be the most profitable, but we've done that on the sort of social responsibility side. Uh, we are, like many um, solar lamp companies, preparing to do our pay-as-you-go technology, and that would easily fit into the entrepreneurial program. Um, and I, you know, those do allow people to climb an energy ladder, and it makes it easier for them to invest in. And it's becoming quite successful across Africa, and there's no reason why that wouldn't be successful in the refugee camps as well. So, um, but I haven't seen any support uh, for companies to go into refugee camps or to go into uh, host communities in those areas uh, specifically. Yeah, for, um, for the Global Alliance, so our general work is um, funded through a combination of both regular donor funding and capital investment. On the humanitarian side, um, it's almost exclusively donor funding. However, um, the funding that we channel to um, support different projects in the field, um, we try to funnel it towards projects that have a built-in sustainability plan. Um, that is like, you know, because donor funding is by its definition uh, limited to a certain, you know, couple, a certain number of years and humanitarian settings always need to be thought of in the long term, um, we encourage people to think about how this product will, or product or project will scale up and become sustainable, whether that's being subsidized through revolving loans or carbon financing um, or building uh, like a, a a small market for maybe for a certain fuel or a cook stove in a combination of a refugee camp and a host community. So it's a, a combination of um, donor funding to sort of move things off the ground and then different market-based approaches to keep them going after the initial couple of years. And uh, this is Paul here. And on the, the page you go, it is certainly the way um, we would like to go uh, to address household energy. Um, the one thing that uh, will probably be, we've got a few pay as you go projects that we're planning uh, for the next, over the next 18 months. But the big thing is the economic climate, be it brought on from environmental effects or maybe government uh, restrictions or requirements with regards to the right to work. So on the pay as you go, we, we're its biggest fan. Um, but within some of the economic and environmental areas we work in, it's, uh, it's, it, it could prove difficult. Um, with regards to funding, uh, UNHCR's, a lot of their energy interventions have been very, very strongly supported by the IKEA Foundation. And that's my two cents. Great. Thank you, Paul. And uh, with that, uh, we are out of time, so if we did not have time to get to your questions, I do apologize, but I will be forwarding those through email to our panelists um, so uh, they can respond uh, through email to your, to your question. 
Um, and on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I do again just want to thank our panelists for the, the excellent presentations and uh, addressing each of those questions. Um, and also to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Uh, thank you very much for the time. We do appreciate it. And I would like to also invite each of you to visit the Clean Energy Solutions Center training page under this webinar. You'll find the PDF copies of the presentations as well as a recording of this webinar in its entirety. We'll be getting that up there in the next one to two days. Um, also, I do encourage you to check the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel where you'll find this recording as well as all the other Clean Energy Solutions Center webinar recordings uh, that we've done. So uh, finally, before we close out, I would like to kindly ask you to just take a moment to complete the short survey that will pop up once we close the webinar. And with that, uh, thank you again to everyone and please enjoy the rest of your day and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our webinar.